Welcome back. Today we're going to do the standard radiographic projections of the shoulder. There are two normal projections that are typically taken to include internal and external rotation of the shoulder. There are several accessory projections such as axillary views, baby arm views, and these views help to evaluate the structures of the shoulder in a slightly different orientation. We'll just be doing the normal views today and hopefully in the future get around to doing some accessory views tutorial. With the normal AP internal and external rotation, the patient is exactly up against the bucky in an A to P uh, direction. There is a variation of the AP projection which is called the Grashy view in which the patient is rotated 15 to 30 degrees into the bucky with the shoulder being x-rayed. This allows for adequate visualization through the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so let's get started. Let's start by just identifying each osseous structure. So this is the humerus. Here are ribs. Here is the scapula. And here is the clavicle. Now let's start with the humerus. There's an easy way to tell between internal and external rotation views of the shoulder. They have to do with the position of the humeral tuberosities. Here is the greater tuberosity of the humerus. Right next to it is going to be the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. Notice that they're both on the external aspect of the humerus in this projection. Therefore, this is an external rotation projection. You'll notice once we get to the internal rotation projection that the tuberosities will be visualized along the internal margin of the humerus when placed in internal rotation. Between the tuberosities is this more lucent area. This is actually the intertubercular groove and the long head of the biceps tendon lives in this location. Other anatomy that can be seen. Here is the humeral head, humeral neck, and humeral shaft. Moving on to the scapula. Here is the axillary medial border of the scapula. Now the scapula is a flat bone and does have multiple landmarks that we will discuss, most of which you can see on a shoulder projection. So here is the axillary border. There is an angle formed by the inferior portion of the scapula. This is called the inferior angle of the scapula. The scapula also contains the glenoid. The glenoid is a flat, slightly concave structure that receives the humeral head to make the glenohumeral joint. Now the glenohumeral joint, which is located in this location, is evaluated at three locations. We typically evaluate the inferior, middle, and superior portions of the glenohumeral joint to evaluate for joint space narrowing. Now this is not a common joint to have degenerative joint space narrowing simply because this is not a weight-bearing joint. However, the labrum, which is the cartilaginous structure, essentially the articular surface of the glenoid, can undergo degeneration and therefore the joint can narrow. To continue on with landmarks on the scapula, here is the scapular spine. The scapular spine is a very linear-like structure and it is just including the linear structure that's actually still on the scapula. What you'll notice is that the scapular spine actually extends out to become the acromion process. Now the acromion process will articulate with the clavicle making the acromio clavicular joint. Now the AC joint is prone to injury. I'm sure we've all heard of AC joint separations or AC joint sprains or strains. Both of these or all these entities will include damage to this particular joint. We assess this joint space at the top and at the bottom. And this is because there can be a slight V-like configuration to this joint and it's normal. Now to continue on with the clavicle, here we have this prominent tuberosity that lives under the clavicle. This is called the conoid tubercle. The conoid tubercle. <laughs> There's this other finger-like projection in which is called the coracoid process coracoid process. We have the coracoid process here and we have the conoid tubercle here. Easily confused. Just be sure to get them straight before a testing situation. Now the clavicle in general is 
um, divided into proximal, medial, and distal portions. So this is considered the distal portion of the clavicle. Here's the middle portion of the clavicle, clavicle middle third, and we can't see the proximal or most medial uh, portion of the clavicle. We can also evaluate ribs. Now remember that the more horizontal aspects of the ribs are going to be the posterior aspects of the ribs, and this looks like it's the second rib, and here's the anterior portion of the second rib, and you'll notice this comes around and kind of hooks around. And so when you're counting ribs, it's very important that you follow them all the way around to the full course of the rib, especially when you're evaluating for rib fractures. Now notice that you can also see a good amount of lung tissue. In my experience, there has been instances where a shoulder projection was taken and a lung mass was found. So it's very important to evaluate the lung tissue that's visualized in this region. Let me just clean up a little bit. Other structures that we can evaluate. Well, the rest is going to be soft tissues. Here's the axillary soft tissue. You may see calcifications, calcified lymph nodes. If there's avulsion fractures off of the humerus or even off of the scapula, you may see um, calcification or bony fragments within this region. Now this is the area of the deltoid musculature and oftentimes you may see a very prominent bump on the humerus down here at the deltoid insertion point. Um, now we'll move on to the internal rotation projection. We are now looking at the internal rotation projection. I just want to draw your eyes to the humerus because we need to be able to determine whether this is an internal or external rotation view when you don't already know what it is. So in this case, I'll draw your attention here. This is actually the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. Notice that it's along the internal margin of the humerus. Therefore, this is an internal rotation view. Now, the greater tuberosity, you're actually looking into or on FOSS, and so it basically will not be very apparent. So the lesser tuberosity will be visualized along the internal margin of the humerus on internal rotation views, whereas on external rotation views, which we just completed, you will see the greater and lesser tuberosity along the lateral or external aspect of the humerus. The structures that are seen well on the external rotation view are essentially seen well on the internal rotation view as well. The only structure that really moves is the humerus. We're basically twisting the humerus along its long axis to get varying visualization of the articular surface, humeral head, and neck regions. Now, <clears throat> the intertubercular groove will live in this location. Remember, this is where the long head of the biceps tendon will pass before it inter inserts into the shoulder. Now, the bicipital tendon can um, become dislocated. Radiographically, you can't see that. However, one knows that the bicipital groove, also known as the intertubercular groove, is the region where that tendon lives normally. Now, let's move on. This is the acromion process. Here is the clavicle, acromioclavicular joint, conoid tubercle, coracoid process, glenoid fossa, axillary or lateral border of the scapula, inferior, inferior angle of the scapula, ribs, lung tissue, axilla, deltoid musculature. Now this is the extent of the soft tissue and osseous structures that we can see on views of the shoulder. One thing that I do want to mention though is this region here between the clavicle and the humerus as well as the acromion process. Now it's important to remember that the rotator cuff musculature lives in this location. So whenever we're evaluating the rotator cuff, radiographs are typically not going to be useful. MRI examinations have the best spatial resolution to evaluate uh, soft tissue structures, including labral tears or rotator cuff tears. However, the distance between the humerus and the clavicle is a very important distance, as well as the distance between the acromion and the humerus. Now this distance is called the acromiohumeral distance and basically this distance should not be anything less than 7 to 11 millimeters. 
When this distance measures less than 7 millimeters, it's highly indicative of a chronic rotator cuff tear. So if you evaluate this space and it's very, very narrow, this is definitely an indication to, when combined with clinical findings, is an indication or justification to obtain an MRI examination of the shoulder. So just keep that in mind. And I hope this tutorial is useful for you. Please join us for future tutorials.